the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Good morning. I'm Lynn Morgan. I'm the pastor of St. Matthew's United Church of Christ in Hamburg, New York, and I'd like to welcome you to this online service of worship. This morning we will hear a sermon from Peter that's recorded in the book of Acts. And it's delivered to an astonished crowd who has just seen a man healed, but they think that the healing is the result of Peter and John's power. But Peter explains to them, he was healed by the power of the risen Christ. In 1 John, we are told that God's love is what makes us the children of God, but there's a further transformation yet to come that we will be transformed as we see the glory of the risen Christ. And in the gospel, we bounce over this week to the gospel of Luke, where we read yet another encounter that the early disciples had with the risen Christ. And this passage, I think especially, invites us to think about where we encounter Christ in our lives. And now I ask you to give your attention to Perry Kalpa as he shares with us the news of the church. Good morning. I'm Perry Kelp, and I want to welcome you to this online service of worship for the third Sunday of Easter. We have been producing online pre-recorded services for more than a year, and they have allowed us to share worship as a community of faith, even when we could not be in the building together. As you know, in-person services have resumed. Even though we cannot sing together, and we must follow social distancing requirements, a portion of our congregation is now meeting in person. It is our hope very soon to begin having a shared worship experience for those in person and those who join in through the internet. We plan to carry our services over YouTube as a live stream. For the time being, we do not plan to implement Facebook Live but we will give links and instructions to all through the e-newsletter so you will know how to connect. When we have live streaming service in place, it will allow all of us to worship together from different places. And for those who cannot be present in person or online at 10.30 on Sunday morning, a recording of the service will also be available to watch after the live stream ends. In this holy season of Easter, we are mindful that Christ meets us where we live, always in person, always in love. We are planning to have a chicken barbecue here at St. Matthew's on Saturday, June the 5th. Please mark your calendars. You can purchase pre-sale tickets for $10. On the day of the barbecue, tickets will cost $12 so buy early and save. Tickets will be sold before and after worship on Sunday mornings. You can also purchase tickets through the church office Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Pre-sale tickets will be available from now until May 23rd. The barbecue proceeds help support the outreach and mission work of St. Matthew's, so be sure to buy yourself some chicken and invite your friends to come along. As we emerge from the restrictions placed on us by the pandemic, we are eagerly looking forward to the fall, when we hope all our church activities will resume better than before. One of the things we look forward to is the return of Sunday school for our children. There is a crucial need for people to be part of the team who will assist in the faith formation of the next generation of St. Matthews. We ask each of you to prayerfully consider if God is calling you to take a part in the Christian education of our children. We envision a team approach to Sunday school with shared teaching responsibilities so that teachers do not have to commit to teaching every Sunday. If you would like to explore this avenue of service, please contact Pastor Lynn. And now, let us turn our hearts and minds to worship. 
As we begin our worship, I invite you to pray with me. Eternal God, you have spoken to your people in every generation. You spoke through law and prophets. You spoke to those who were receptive as well as those who were slow to hear and hard of heart. You breathed forth your word into flesh and spoke through the life and ministry of Jesus. You spoke in agonizing clarity from the cross and in glorious victory that echoed from an empty tomb. Speak to us now, we pray, and illumine our minds even as we open our hearts so that we might have a new understanding and that through them we may encounter anew the risen Christ. Amen. A reading from the book of the Acts of the Apostles. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people. You Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given him the perfect health in the presence of all of you. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, therefore, and to turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our responsorial this morning is Psalm 4. Answer me when I call, O God, defender of my cause. You set me free when I am hard pressed. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. You mortals, how long will you dishonor my glory? How long will you worship dumb idols and run after false gods? Know that the Lord does wonders for the faithful. When I call upon the Lord, he will hear me. Tremble then, and do not sin. Speak to your heart in silence upon your bed. Offer the appointed sacrifices, and put your trust in the Lord. Many are saying, oh, that we might see better times. Lift up the light of your countenance upon us, O Lord. You have put gladness in my heart, more than when grain and wine and oil increase. I lie down in peace. At once I fall asleep, for only you, Lord, make me dwell in safety. A reading from the first letter of John. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this, when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. 
Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I, myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones, which you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering. He said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, God. 
I wonder how many of you remember when spring cleaning was a thing. I vividly remember spring cleaning and fall cleaning when every curtain and drape came down, every window was washed, every wall, every floor was scrubbed, even down in the basement, everything was straightened out and the tile floor that we had down there had to be washed and waxed every spring cleaning. I remember it very well. And I remember one time when I was doing spring cleaning, I had been exiled down into the basement. And I was there sullenly doing the job that I had to do. And I knew I was doing pretty good, actually, to have been assigned basement work, because down in the basement, I was removed from the unblinking eye of my mother, who was upstairs directing the rest of the spring cleaning. If you told my mother, that her kitchen floor was clean enough that you could eat off it, she'd be insulted because her goal is not that you could merely eat off her kitchen floor, but rather that should the need arise, it was a sterile field upon which one could do emergency surgery. She took it to extremes, if you know what I mean. And so I was kind of grateful to be down in the basement doing my thing, and I was sorting stuff out. What goes to goodwill, what goes back up on the shelves, what has to be straightened out, what has to be categorized, what has to be thrown out. And I fell prey to that great enemy of any organization of basements or attics. And that is, I began to look at the stuff that I was sorting through. And I began to read things as I was putting them away. And anybody who's ever tried to clean out an attic or a basement knows that that's the kiss of death to efficiency. And as I was looking through the things down there that I was sorting through and putting away, I came across a frilly card. You know, one of those fancy schmancy cards that had been saved by my parents for some reason. And so I looked at this card and I saw that it was one that my father had sent to my mother. More than that, it was one that had been sent on their wedding day, June 3rd, 1950. And I thought to myself, this is so peculiar. It was kind of rocking my little teenage world to envision my father sending this romantic, frilly card to my mother on their wedding day, of all things. Now, I have to tell you, my father was a wonderful person, a man who I will always hold in the highest regard and admiration. He was a kind and gentle man, a peacemaker, a person who I very literally never saw fail to put the other person first, when it required him to make a sacrifice. He was a good man, but he was not an emotionally expressive man. I think I was 40 before I heard him say, I love you. I knew it, of course, but he was not the kind of person to say those things. He was a man of his generation, if you will. And so the idea that he had bought and inscribed a frilly romantic card to my parents was, was shocking to me. You know, as a teenager, it was hard to imagine that my parents had ever been in love. And so, when you find something like this, some personal expression of the personal and intimate relationship of your parents, as a child, what ought you to do? You ought to just put that away, unopened, unexamined, so naturally, I read it. I don't remember what was written in that card entirely. It was probably a lot of romantic drivel that made me uncomfortable. But what I remember that I read, which of course I had no right to look at, but the thing that I remember to this day, like 45 years later, is that my father did what we sometimes do on a card of any kind. We might have a quote that we'd like to share with the person, and so we inscribe that on the facing page of the inside of the card. And so as you open the card, you look on the left-hand side, my father had written there the very first part of the reading that we heard from 1 John earlier in the service. In good King James English, he wrote, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. Close quote, parentheses, 1 John 1, uh, 1 John 3, 1. As I read it, 
I thought to myself, I can't believe that my dad was quoting scripture to my mother in this romantic card on the day in which they were to be wed. Now, my parents were devout people, so it didn't surprise me that he would have assumed the, you know, a scripture quote would be okay to send. But what struck me then and what strikes me now is that he situated the love that they have, that they shared for 60 years of marriage, he situated that love as part of the gift, the bestowal of God on both of them. I never forgot it. Now later, when I became a little better at reading and interpreting scripture, I wanted to go and tell my dad that uh, his scripture scholarship was not all that great because first John wasn't talking about romantic love. That verse goes on to say, behold what manner of love the Father has given us that we are called the children of God. And that is what we are. First John was saying, we are made the children of God by God's love. We have this status as God's children, not because of our moral efforts, not because of how we strive to become better people, not because of the good things we do to help those who are in need, not because of the sacrifices that we make or the intentions that we prod ourselves to become better. We are God's children because God has bestowed love on us. And so really, my dad wasn't so far off in his interpretation of that scripture. All the love that we have to share with one another is a grace. All the love that we give to each other as lovers and spouses, as parents and children, as friends, all of our love for nation and place and tribe, all of our love for one another, is bestowed on us and is part of our heritage as children of God. See what manner of love God has given us that we might be called the children of God. And that verse goes on to say, that's what we are now, God's children. But it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. We are God's children by grace, by love, but there's more to come. What we are now is just a foretaste. Eventually, someday, we're going to see Christ as he is, and seeing him as he is, we're gonna be transformed. Now, if you've ever thought about the idea of purgatory, think about it in those terms. Someday, the beatific vision, we'll see Christ face to face. We will have a meeting with him that is not mediated by our imagination or our minds or our physicality or anything else. We will meet him face to face at the end of our earthly life, at the end of all history when he comes in glory. At some point, we're going to meet Christ and we will see him as he is. And that encounter, 1 John says, is going to be transformative. And in that moment, we will become like him, which means in that moment, all that is not like him will be purged away. It will be a purgative moment. So when we think about purgation and purgatory, we usually think about, well, the kind of crudest image of it is that a prison sentence that somebody does after their life is over that they have to serve until they're able to come into the fuller blessing of heaven. It's a lousy image of purgatory. Think rather that we will encounter Christ as he truly is, and that encounter will transform us, and it will purge away all of the things in us that remain that are not Christ-like. That may very well be an uncomfortable experience for most of us, and I don't know if it takes place in an instant or if like we have usually crudely understood about purgatory, whether it will take tens of thousands of years. We don't know. But we know that seeing him will change us, transform us, make us like him. All throughout the Easter season, we are encountered by these stories of the disciples of Jesus meeting the risen Christ, always by surprise. 
And here today, we encounter one in Luke. The context for this story in Luke is that it happens immediately after the story of the walk to Emmaus, which of course you know. Jesus is walking as a stranger, unrecognized, with two disciples as they make their way from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And they invite this stranger to stay with them. And all along the way, he's been talking to them about the scriptures and about the Messiah. And then at the table, he breaks the bread and they recognize him and he disappears. And they run, lickety split, back to Jerusalem and they tell the other disciples what has happened. And it's in this moment of telling the other disciples that Jesus appears in the story we just read. And so they're all primed. They just heard this story about how Jesus encounters them in places that they least expect him, in forms that they don't recognize him, and that he is with them and he's risen. And then he comes in their presence, and they're scared to death. They're startled, they don't know what to do, they think they're seeing a ghost. And Jesus says what Jesus always says to us when he meets us, peace be with you. And he says, don't be afraid. I'm not a ghost. I, ha I have flesh and bones. Look at my wounds. Have you got anything to eat? And they give him some heart-healthy broiled fish, and he eats it with them to demonstrate to them that, that he's no ghost. And he shares with them that simple meal. Now, if this had happened last week, maybe Jesus would have met me up at the East Eden Tavern, and instead of heart-healthy broiled fish, he would have beer-battered fish, and which he would enjoy much more, don't you think? Yes, he would. But he meets them in these ordinary circumstances, and he eats with them, and then he shares with them how his life and ministry, his death and his victory over death, it's all of a piece with the great love story that God has been enacting with humanity, right from the very beginning, from Adam and Noah and Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, Moses and the prophets and all of the psalmists have all talked about a God who so loves the world that God enters into relationship with God's people. God draws them closer to God's self and to one another. God calls them to justice and to peace and to life abundant and his life and his ministry, his death and his victory over death is all consonant with that long story. And he helps them understand how it all fits in and how God is calling them to be part of this story, to go forth and proclaim this mercy, this forgiveness, this grace of God, this welcome to outcasts and sinners, beginning in Jerusalem and going to all of the world. These stories that are in the scripture they are there in part to say Jesus really did raise from death. That the disciples did not just have a vision or an imagined victory that Jesus accomplished over death, but that somehow beyond our understanding, he truly did emerge victorious over death. And so when we hear stories of him showing his wounds and eating food and being touched and yet being able to appear out of nowhere and disappear instantly, we're given these stories so that the church could demonstrate and to articulate to one another that the story's true. He really did raise from death. But that's not the only reason that these stories are remembered and treasured. They are for us. That is, they're for those of us who don't belong to that first generation of disciples, who had no opportunity to behold him and to be scared to death, or to see him but not recognize him until he reminded us of his presence. They're told to us so that we in our generation might know how to recognize the risen Lord. And the answers are right there in these stories. How might we, so many hundreds and thousands of years later, meet this risen Christ as they did? We might meet him in the word. In each of these stories, he breaks open the word of God to them so that their eyes might be open, so that their hearts might be open, so that they might see this risen Christ present there in their story, long before the birth of Jesus and long after. 
He meets them in a meal. This, my friends, is the reason why the whole church from the very beginning until like just a couple hundred years ago never met without sharing together the word and the sacrament. The word of God broken open, the bread broken open, the wine consumed so that we might experience Christ not only with our eyes and our ears, but that we might taste him body and blood and become one with him. We meet Christ in the word. We meet Christ in that holy meal. But not only in that holy meal, not only in the Eucharistic meal, but we meet him at the table. Jesus shares table fellowship throughout his earthly ministry with outcasts and sinners, with prostitutes and tax collectors, with the people who were unwashed and unwanted, the people who the best folks in society did not want to share their table with. He met and shared table with all those who were undesirable, and especially those who were undesirable to religious folks like us. And so these stories tell us if you would want to see this risen Christ and encounter him, then you need to open your heart and your eyes to the word of God and open yourself to the experience of meeting him in the sacred table, but also open your real tables to those who are outcast and unwanted. Make a welcome place to everyone, and especially those who are forgotten and who are undesired. And like those folks who walked from Jerusalem to Emmaus, Make yourself open to the stranger who accompanies you along life's way, who may indeed be the presence of the risen Christ with you. First John says, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we might be called the children of God and that is who we are. But what we will be Well, that hasn't been revealed yet. But we'll be like him because we'll see him as he is. We'll not just see Christ in the beatific vision at the end of this earthly life or at the end of human history when he comes again in glory. We can see Christ in scripture and in sacrament and in opening our lives and our tables and our fellowship to all those who, like Christ, are welcome here. And in doing so, in seeing Christ in the scripture, in the sacrament, in the stranger, as we behold him in those ways, we become like him day by day, more and more, until finally we are transformed when we see him face to face. Amen. And now together, let us offer up our prayers on behalf of the church and the world and ourselves.
We pray to you, our risen Christ and Lord. You opened the minds of your disciples to understand the scriptures. We ask that you would open the eyes of your church to find in the scriptures the source of healing, the shape of our mission, and the good news that you have given us to share. Lord Christ, you showed your wounded hands and feet to wavering disciples. Grant that we, also, your wavering disciples, might see your risen presence in all the wounded of the world who you have called upon us to care for. Redeemer and friend, you intercede before the Father on our behalf. Grant us compassionate hearts as we lift up the oppressed and the rejected of the world. Suffering servant of God, you bore the unjust rule of temple and empire. Grant your church courage in the struggle for justice and equality. Turn the hearts of all who hold authority to serve those in their care with compassion and wisdom. Lord Jesus, you revealed the light of God in whom there is no darkness at all. We pray for God's light to shine in places of darkness where evil flourishes. In your abundant grace, turn the hearts of those who do evil from darkness into your transforming light. Merciful Savior, your touch brings healing and hope. Bring your healing and peace to all who suffer this day. We pray especially for Jamie and Adam and Ozzy, for Jane and Beth, for Carl, for John and Karen, Brandon, Chase, Jewel, Nancy, Emily and Sarah, Frank, Bessie, Shirley, Helen, and Marvin. Loving God, you have glorified your son Jesus and given him the name above every other, the name by which we are saved. Grant us courage to act in his name and the compassion to act in his character. Accept our prayers and praise, for they are offered in the name of our Savior, Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Go now to be God's children in the world with open minds to understand the needs of those around us. Go now to be Christ's servants in the world with open hands to share blessing with all. Go now to be the Spirit's hope for the world with open hearts to welcome those who have no one to care for them. And go with the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.